Right guys, welcome to this video. Now, have you been suffering from a disease? This disease is known as TikTok retardation. Now, if that means you've got no more than a 10 second attention span, this video is not for you. So we're gonna talk about the misconceptions of samurai, and I'm gonna be doing it in association with other channels. But first of all, let's start with a joke. Okay, asked why there were so many bends in a new road, a highway spokesman said, I can't give you a straight answer. <laughs> All you can say is, that's why uh, there are so many bends in a new road. A highway spokesman could not give a straight answer. But, you know, you can say it any way you want. Right, let me take that one off, guys. If you've got any jokes, make sure you post them below. Right, I'm working with the mighty shogunate, Nick. We're working with um, Nick from, um, Scott from Sengoku Studies and also from Stephen Nogiri from Tadagenji, Traditions of the Samurai Tadagenji. They are going to link their channels and their videos for this month below. Literally, before you go anywhere, go down, click each link, subscribe to them, watch their videos. But I'm going to go over uh, the month's topic, which is Samurai Misconceptions. All right, guys? And before we go into it if you want to help me out get yourself a copy of the art of war or the book of ninja or one of my books or just subscribe and uh, send me a million pounds that would be nice right okie dokie guys so we've had three fantastic videos this month from the three channels it's a shame nobody else is joining us you're all welcome to join us so let I, what i'm going to do is i'm going to take you through them i'm going to do it as quick as i can but this is basically everything summed up but you must go back to the original videos and find out what they are talking about in detail so vegetarians you must have heard it japan was a vegetarian state until the west uh, a country until the westerners came and introduced them to meat and now now they eat meat they've all gone tall i've heard that definitely right but it turns out it's not true it's not true at all and uh, there's a few reasons for this yes the height of japanese people has increased with the um addition of more meat into their diet somebody might be able to do more on this but definitely i started going to japan in 2004 and since then it's now nearly 20 years later i used to look down at the average male and now i look up at the average male even though i think the average overall is still lower than me i'm five foot ten um japanese people i think are five eight five nine but on the whole i'm looking at the younger people because you're still that that average has been brought down by the older people but new High school students, I go like that now. You know what I mean? <laughs> They're big, big lads. And I'm like, I remember when I got to Japan, I was like, Deedy people, I'm in the land of the elves. 20 years later, when the World War II veterans have all gone and we're in the next generational shift, you can see it going. So, what did the Japanese eat? So, the Japanese are basically, or medieval Japanese, would be dependent on their area. Yep, it's as simple as that. There is no railways, there is no um, cars, there's no highways, there's nothing like that. There is foot traffic only. Wagons, carts, there is wagons and carts of some form, and horse, pack horses, and generally people carrying stuff. So on the hut and ships, of course, on the whole, you would eat what was local to you, except where you would be able to afford or could take on imports, exports from the local areas around within the islands or wherever. Now I'm going to go through some of the stuff. Now everybody imagines that everybody's eating sushi in Japan and raw fish. No, you don't eat raw fish in Asia unless it's bloody well killed there and then. And if I kill a raw fish and then take three days to walk it to somewhere else because it's going to take that long to get there, you're not having it. It's going to be rancid, it's going to be rotten in the heat, I'm going to be very sick. So basically, where in Japan, what you're looking at is a lot of salted fish, a lot of, um, pro, um, not the word processed, a lot of, um, come on Anthony, think of the word, sort of pickled, um, preserved things. And that's a lot of what you do. And you still get that in the Japanese diet today. The, the pickled plums, they preserve this these sort of like different vegetables because th that's part of their history. They, they haven't moved away from that. Even though they don't need to pickle them anymore, they can come fresh. You get that in their diet. So you also um, used to find that... Um, sorry, what am I trying to say? You also find that, uh, of course, it's social and class distinction. So you might be able to afford something from over there and lower people might not. But don't always imagine, and I hate it when people do this, that peasants were eating mud and worms and the aristocracy were eating loads of this. I've actually read multiple very impressive books on medieval Europe and their food traditions in medieval Europe. And you know what? None of them agree what the medieval people eat. 
None of them. One of them's like, they'd never see fish in their life. Fish was the most delicate thing. Another one said, uh, apprentices were so fed up of full-blown salmon that they were just threw it back and said we don't want any more full salmon if i could afford a full salmon today i'd be well happy and also i've read that oh like steak and beef was considered low level because you wanted venison so only peasants would have a steak and then the other end of the scale it's like oh they only had oats and that's it nobody has ever been approved to me and it's the same in japan in japan you get hunters now everybody imagines that only samurai were using guns at the time but actually you got hunters and they were hunting birds they were hunting hunting monkeys now i have actually seen monkey as a way to use samurai straps on armor and i don't know whether they ate the flesh i can't imagine somebody's going to shoot a monkey strip it of his flesh and say or strip it of its skin and say you know what let's just leave that flesh there to rot I can't imagine they wouldn't eat it. So what do you reckon? Now, of course, the other one is Buddhism and meat. Yeah, it's like, oh, Buddhists don't eat meat, do they? Yeah, they do. Uh, there's a, a story. The Buddhists today in Japan eat meat. You're not allowed to eat meat inside a holy area, basically. It's a massive misconception that Buddhists don't eat meat. They do, especially Japanese Buddhists. And um, and they don't drink alcohol. Leathered and on a hot dog. Seen it all the time. And you could say, well, do you mean like more real monks in the past? They were less real and uh, they were just as bad. Um, William Adams in his letters um, from the 1600s says on a Friday, basically the monks used to come down from the temples, shag the young boys and eat and get pissed. Basically, it was a Friday night out in the gay village. You know what I mean? That's basically what the monks did. So then you, the idea you've got is like, I did hear of one story that they were going to kill a pig in a temple and they said, no, no, we can't kill a pig in a temple. So they pulled it outside of the gate, slaughtered the pig, cut all the meat, brought the meat back inside the temple and ate it. You know what I mean? Because it would be bad to eat the meat as Buddhists in the in the temple. They decided that was not the best idea. So the, the, the agreement was go around the back and kill it. You know, brilliant. So... That video was mainly from um, Scott from Sengoku Studies. And I think it's a brilliant... And I think he opens it by saying, maybe you won't be interested in this. I think it's one of the major ones, to be honest. The Japanese were not vegetarian, nor were they... You know, what they did do is hardly touch their food. We have reports from the Jesuits where it's like the Japanese would use utensils to not touch their food. Whereas they were a bit confused by the Jesuits who picked it up with their hands and ate it and then wiped their... And, you know, and to be honest, very cleanly washed their hands in lemon-scented water or whatever it was. Dried them on freshly pressed napkins and ate like this. And the Japanese were like, you filthy, disgusting people. You know what I mean? It weren't like they were going, ah, snot dripping onto the thingy and you know picking their ear going ah this is mint medieval people just didn't eat like that that's a that's a hollywood um thing and and to add to that so something that um nick from the shogun that says which is absolutely right is misconceptions are everywhere and we all suffer from them i so the point of what i'm doing is to get rid of the misconceptions i came along into the historical research community of the ninja and samurai only with the misconceptions as what I thought was truth. And bit by bit, I'm breaking them down. And anybody out there who thinks they have not fell prey to the misconceptions is wrong. Even the mighty Stephen Dodgeri, who literally does know his way around the old Japanese history pretty well. Misconceptions are in there. What the, we're doing is some people have less misconceptions, other people have more misconceptions, yeah? And you get some people, ninjas throw shurikens and run around and disappear. Okay, well, you know, samurai, ashigaru, sort of do reconnaissance, espionage. You know, you, you get this idea of, of this weighing scales of people who've got the most misconceptions. I still am full of misconceptions and don't know enough, and we're breaking them down bit by bit. And it's not a case of say Scott's got more misconceptions than me or I've got more misconceptions than Scott. And it's about who's done what research into where. So, because I've read some amazing books on samurai history and then it comes to the ninja section and you're like, oh, do I put this book down? I remember reading the Yagi book. I put it on this channel and I said, should I read this book? Because it just, the stuff it says about ninjas are terrible. But does that mean the rest of it's terrible? Not really. It might be just there's misconceptions in there. I remember reading a book by a professor or a doctor at a university it was peer-reviewed and it was talking about Hatsumi and Kujikiri and the ninja and I was like oh my god this is terrible because he had just thought oh Kujikiri ninjas right so let's move on to um Scott from uh, Nick from the Shogunate right so Nick says that 
one thing we all imagine is that it's like the warring periods when everybody was going to war. So very, very quickly, there's a standing army in ancient Japan. That gets thrown away to the first samurai. The first samurai have a war to who's, see who's the best, you know, who's going to rule the emperor. And then basically there's a bit in the middle called the Sengoku period where everybody's anyone's game. We're all fighting for the throne. It's Game of Thrones. And then you get the bit afterwards where they've won Game of Thrones and they're carrying on. You know what I mean? I say it's peaceful now. We've won Game of Thrones. And he's saying, well, actually, that's not quite, you know, they didn't, it's not that clear cut. It's what happened, but it's not that clear cut. And he is right that the idea that there was in the, in the warring periods, the Game of Thrones period, yeah, everybody's vying for the throne. But actually, realistically, only a handful of clans know they can get the throne, yeah? By throne, I mean the shogunate, the, the, the place you want to be, you know, the, 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 the main general who is far more powerful than the emperor. So what you actually find is a lot of clans are aligning themselves, aligning themselves with the more powerful ones. And what you find is, oh, what they're trying to do is keep their autonomy. This is something everybody misunderstands about the ninja and Eager and Coker. Ninja were from Eager and Coker and they were separate from the samurai. No, at that period, everybody was separate. They were all broken down and there was a vague idea of the shogun. There's a vague idea of the emperor. The lines are still going on, but he's got no real power. It's like, so I'm in... Norfolk it's like the queen coming to my house and say well you can't do that and you can't do this and you can't do that well the king I should say so long live the king um you know if you're standing um basically um uh, if you've not seen this hello hello clap uh it's a I'm not doing a Nazi salute it's actually a comedy sketch from uh hello hello but in today's world you can't do these things um right but you know prince Charles, uh, king charles arrives and he says right Get out. I want this land now. You know, it just isn't. It doesn't happen. The emperor didn't turn up to the north of Japan and say, this is happening. Or the shogun didn't turn up. They just didn't have that power in that in jurisdiction. So what you found is a lot of autonomous clans who were like, let's just keep our borders. Let's expand by a couple of acres here. And let's expand by a 100 acres there. And only later, towards the end of the Sengoku period, did you get three major unifiers. And they had to be, they, they, they were ones who geared it up. And it was geared up for them, really. And it was being pushed into that way. And they created new reforms. And um, Nick is correct. Loads of new ways were brought. In fact, you could say, and it was said a lot again. And I love going back to the Jesuits. The Jesuits say Japan before the Sengoku period and Japan after the Sengoku period are different places. In fact, the language changed, the society changed, the way, you know, it used to be a very Chinese-based culture. You get this idea, and especially with Zen, you know, we have this idea of Zen and it's all very minimalistic and stoic and there's this bamboo and there's a there's a leaf. Like, look at his leaf. Praise the leaf. You know, th before that, it was paint everything red, put gaudy banners on it. Um, we all sit in chairs for the tea ceremony. Something nobody really knows is you sit in chairs for the tea ceremony. You have drawers, you pull out the tea, you're having a chat, everyone's having a booze up, you've got beer with you. That's the tea ceremony. After the Sengoku period, empty room, one little teapot, no chairs, Stripped down, old wood, sip, chat, talk a little bit of politics, relax, go back, enjoy, leave the tea room, maybe have a drink, some alcohol, bow, send a letter of thanks, off you go. Yep, totally changes. Japan, the face of Japan changes over the Sengoku period. But we imagine it's the same before and the same after. It's not. So... The next thing that Nick's saying is maps. He's absolutely right. And I, I didn't know this at all. I didn't know this. You have a vague inkling, but he's totally right. Is The maps we get presented with are not realistic. They are not incorrect, but they don't show all the different factions. It's like, um, so for example, it's like saying, I'll do a football reference, which I'm not very good at. But Manchester United, yep, soccer that is, is in Manchester. And so when you're looking at a map of football clubs across England... You're like, or America for their rugby football. Don't know why you call it football, boys. We invented the sport. It's called football. You guys call football things where you hold it with your hand. Watch this. Kick. Football. Watch this. Football. Are you crazy? It's called rugby. And you're soft because you're wearing helmets. <laughs> Even though I hate sports, guys. So anyway, right. So you're, you've got... The Dallas Cowboys. This is shows you how much I know. Dallas Cowboys. Da, 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 da. And and you look at a map of America and it's like, this area is Dallas Cowboys and that's it. But what about all the other football teams inside of there? And the sports team from high school football teams to semi-pro football teams. 
I don't live in America. You might be saying, Anthony, your analogy is totally wrong. But let's go back to England. Manchester United. Oh, but what about Manchester City? Yep. What about London? There's tons in there. And then you've got loads of levels. So you might have 400 football clubs, 1,000 football clubs inside of Manchester, just in England. And then across all of England, there's loads. So the actual maps would be ridiculous. Like, here's Salford Reds for rugby. Here's the Salford this for their des. And it would be a scattered map. But Nick is also right by saying... We wouldn't know what to do with it. It'd be too complicated. So let's just go back to Oda Nobunaga rules here, Tokugawa rules here, and Takeda rules here. But on truth, not everybody owned all the land and not everybody was trying to be the shogun and run the the the, the empire that is Japan. Okay, weapons. Again, um, Scott talks about... Uh, Nick, Jesus Christ. Nick talks about the Yari and Naginata. So what I didn't really know is that the Naginata is more popular earlier than the Yari. The spear... So it's the bow first, and we assume then in early samurai times, the naginata, the bow is then still prominent, but the spear becomes more prominent than the gun and then the sword. But the naginata, where does it fit in? Because it's still there and it's a lady's weapon. It's not a lady's weapon. It was absolutely a samurai weapon and the monks tended to use it. But why did they shift from naginata, naginata to yari spear? Why? That is a question that I think Nick should do an amazing video. This is where I, you know, I'm not saying you should, Nick. It's a lot of bloody work. But it's a bloody good point, Nick. It's a bloody good point. And guns. Another misconception is that guns didn't exist before um, 1563. I think it's 63 or 53, whichever one it is. Um, they did. The guns did exist in Japan and they have rudimentary cannon. Sophisticated matchlocks, barrel loading... I suppose they're all barrel loading at that point, but match locks with spring mechanisms and fuses and all this type of thing. Match lock, by the way, is where it's got a burning match on it, a fuse, and flint is where it's got a flint and pan, you know, so there's a slight difference, but and that then would then evolve later. But basically, they had rudimentary cannon before that, so they're not like, oh my god, what is this shooty thing? Something comes out of the end miracle it's like yeah we know we've been fighting with gunpowder against the mongols and the chinese and the koreans for like 300 years but we've never seen that technology before and they couldn't replicate it so they had you know the, the legend is whether it's true or not that actually the um the uh they sold one of the swordsmiths sold his daughter to a westerner to get the the proper mechanism of the spring and everything i don't know how true that is guys you'd have to ask gun samurai matthew okuhara for that um OK, another thing is castles. If you want to see a more realistic depiction, you want to watch Throne of Throne of Blood by Akira Kurosawa or Kurosawa Akira. Uh, there, the castles are mint, dark, made of wood, black, burnt on the outside to stop them being burnt on the hills in desolate places. The idea of castles in the middle of a town is when you have more peace. Castles are usually take advantage of fortified positions. They normally exist where it's hard to attack. They very seldom put a castle where it's easy to attack. The big reason that Japan has the castles you think they have to, that you thought they had today is because there was a, a, an edict, if you like, a rule that came in later and the shogun had said, right, you've got to destroy all your mountain fortresses. You've got to destroy all those castles. It's one castle, one domain, and it's got to be in flatland. And you've only got the restrictions on the moats. You've got to be accessible. Because they were like, if we've got to destroy you, you're not going to build a castle in the bloody hills. Because it'll take a lot of work. So all the major castles that you see, Osaka, Tokyo, um, Wakayama, even though Wakayama's actually on a hill, most of them are flatland, near ports, easy access, and are nothing to do with war. Yep, they are prestige places because the daimyo were like, well... We've only got one castle. Let's put all our resources into this one bloody castle and make it. And they made them big. Before that, their resources went into multiple castles in multiple locations in high positions where they could defend routes in certain places. It's actually a really interesting topic, the evolution of castles. And uh, something we should do more of, I think, on this channel. Um, so the last one that um, Nick was saying is the Sengoku period is not just war and the Edo period. You know, it's not just, oh, they all were bloody and everybody died and, you know, like poverty and they were all walking around like thinking. There was parts of that. Don't get me wrong, guys. The Je Again, going back to the Jesuits said, like, when they arrived in the 1560s, the land could be ra ragged and desolate. When they came back in the 1610s, you know, before they were all banished, it was prosperous and every shops were open. It was all fine. That, but that doesn't mean that, you know, in the Sengoku period, it was a nightmare landscape of hellish landscape. 
it wasn't. There's still many people just didn't go to war. There was places in in Japan where they didn't experience war for years on end. And it's like it's like me now. You know, um, we go into the Falklands in the eighties, and then oh, you know, the, the, my generation went to um, Iraq, and then the next generation went to Afghanistan. And it's like you, not all of us saw war, but we've been in three wars since then. You know, it wasn't like World War Two where it's like you saw the war, and even then. Up in Scotland, they're like, the only thing they saw about the war, you know, in, in some place in the Highlands was like, you know, imagine the Nazi bombers, the Luftwaffe going, quick, we have to get that shepherd's hut. The guy who lives in the crofting on the top of bloody the Hebrides, he's going, what war? I can't get as much sugar. Got no bananas. That war. You know what I mean? That You know, it depends. Right, I'm going to try and hurry this up because it's going to be a 30-minute video. Right, moving on to Stephen Nogiri's video. So, Stephen Nogiri... Uh, you've got to go and subscribe to Stephen Nigeria. It's ridiculous that you don't, guys, because he puts out some awesome content. And he's the one who really defines it, gets it small and gets your detail. But he has the great idea of let's explain clans. So everybody's like, oh, Japanese clans. Yeah, that's a samurai clan. There you are. That's the full clan. Like Nick said with the maps, there's Nobunaga, Oda clan. Well, no, actually, that's not true. So um, Stephen's main point is that the word clan is not really... Oh, sorry. The word clan is correct. But it's 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 too it's too overarching. Now let's start with the word tribe, clan, and house. My personal favourite is house. But in a Western society, tribe tends to mean um, uncivilized people, um, not first world people. When we talk about the German tribes, the barbarian tribes, the hordes, the Mongol tribes, it's usually about a culture where they don't have. Civilization, we you know, running water, buildings, highways, taxation systems, you know, write written letters and all that. So you don't ever go to Egypt and say, oh, look at that tribe there. You know, you would say the different clans or houses of Egypt. You'd probably go for houses of Egypt, yeah. Normally, when you go to Sub Saharan Africa, you say the different tribes. And I have been to Sub Saharan Africa. I stayed there for six weeks or a month or two or whatever it was and was with a tribe. No electricity. It was clearly a tribe. And, but again, England, the Anglo-Saxons, tribes, yep, they didn't have all those markers of advanced civilization. So then you end up with clans. Clans tend to be people who have that before more advanced civilization, but not primitive civilization, not Aboriginal style. And clans tend to be, we can build a castle, we've got a moat, we've got good ironwork, we tend to have, you know, good cloth produce, um, we can create intricate machinery out of wood and cogs and all that, but we don't, you know, it's not really, really advanced. Then you get the like, pyramids and stuff where it's like, oh my God, you know, how do we do that? You know, that's pretty impressive. Even though they didn't even have the wheel, it's like, you know, and today we have houses. Think of um, Dune, House of Atreides, yeah? House Harkonnen and all that. Think of Game of Thrones, House Lannister, House Stark. House Greyjoy, all them, yeah, that's where we're going. So he's saying, though, well, those are the English words we have, tribe, clan, house. But what we have to imagine is that, sorry, not what we have to imagine, what you have to imagine is that in Japanese, there's a lots of terms that are translated as clan and they're not. I'm going to speed this up a bit, guys, because I've spent too long on the other one. So sorry, Stephen, I, I, I've cut you a bit rubbish, but I don't want to make this more than 30 minutes. So he's saying different kanji have different meanings. Like one kanji might mean bloodline, we translate clan. The next one might be, oh, this is this kanji means kin association. It's not bloodline, but they're associated kin, married in, but we use the word clan. Um, there's also uh, Gumi he talks about, which is crews, cliques, work gangs, you know, troops these we just call the clan but actually they're not they're just you know the eager gumi or the the clansman from eager you know i love the word clansman by the way it's one of the best words in the world but there's also words that would directly better translate as factions and or domain so sometimes they say x domain y domain but then the, the japanese would be domain if you actually translate it properly it would be x domain but whenever we write or talk about it we should say x clan so it could be it's x bloodline X kin, X crew, X faction, X domain, X house, you know, but we just say X clan, X clan, X clan, X clan, X clan, because the word clan is so easy to use for samurai because they fit into that. We don't have massive irrigation. We don't have a, you know, a massive network system, railways, uh, a really good system of this. So we tend to use the word clan because they're not primitive. They're not living in mud huts. They have some of the most sophisticated metalwork in the world, but we always tend to go clan. When there's sophistication with metalwork, writing, poetry, art, we hit clan. But then that's why the Anglo-Saxons tend to hit between tribe and clan. But if you go back further to the Britons, it's tribes. They never say 
you never say Roman tribes, do they? The tribe of Rome. But it's the same time as the tribes of Celtic Britain. Why? It's nothing to do with the dates. It's to do with their, um, their actual intellectual level and their sophistication level. And sorry, guys, it's just the truth. Some people were more sophisticated than others, and some people have gone back in time. Let's look at Salford, England. They are clearly below tribes, people now. They are just scum. That's where I'm from. Right, okie dokie. So, um, so he also says, not all samurai are related. So just because somebody said name is Takeda, it's the same as me. My name's Cummins, and I've got a friend called Robert Cummins, and we have the same Cummins spelling and everything. It might be that we were connected at some point 300 years ago, but we're so far apart. And I actually checked, I think there's 100,000 Cummins, and something like four Cummings, something like 50,000 Cummins, something like 30,000 Coims, the original one. So we're all part of the same clan, allegedly. But are we? But then again, you've got to be really careful here with surnames. You've got to be really careful, which I'd like to add to Stephen's video, is you can have every Cummins is probably originally from the Cummins because in they came from um, Flanders, I think. And I should know that. I'm, I've, I've read this multiple times. But basically, they came on with the Normans in 1066 and they took over, not Scotland, Northumbria. All you Scots people out there who are like, this is Scots, my clan's Scottish, this clan's Scottish. When you actually do the research of the clans, most of them are French. So the bloody Scots go on about being Scottish, and half the time they're bloody French or Belgian because they came over with the Normans, and the Normans came over and went, right, we're having this land. So the actual amount of Scottish clans that are Scottish, which came from Ireland, the Scots in Ireland, is far less than you imagine. So when people say, I have myself Scottish ancestry, you mean French, probably. Um, or, you know, Norman, you know, and the Norman again. This is where Stephen says you've got Normans, and you've got connected clans with the Normans. Are they French? Are they Belgian? What they are modern concepts? Where are they from? Basically, France area is where a lot of Scotsmen come from, right? Okay, if you want to think of, um, so you've got to then bring on the main line and the cadet lines. So, what Stephen's saying here is you might have a main branch, but you've got so many branches off it that they're probably no longer connected. And again, I remember reading a report of a Jesuit, I think, and he said uncles and nephews hardly talk to each other in public because their clans are divided. This is our clan. You are a cadet branch. You are separate. You've got a new place. But he said behind closed doors, they'll chat. Oh, you're right, uncle. How's it going, uncle? How's auntie? Is she all right? But in public, they go, they're like, Mr. Takeda, Mr. Takeda, how are you doing? Then once it's gone, everybody's getting a piss up and they're all having knees up and you're all... And you're all paying cards with your auntie, you know, with coins on the table and matchsticks. Who didn't do that? Right. OK. Now, let's so the he's also saying that you can't just say everyone in the clan is part of the clan. This is a I'm going to end on this. This is a brilliant point. Samurai clans are made up of a main family who can afford to buy and hire out an array of other families. OK, I'll give you a Game of Thrones again. Game of Thrones, the Lannisters got loads of cash. But how many Lannisters are there? There's not that many. When you put the Lannister family together, what's the 20, 30, 100 Lannisters? Yeah. And then there's Lannisters who have the blood, but not the name. So I come from a massive family. I come from the Sherrington family. But my name's Cummins because my mother married my father, who became Cummins. And but half my DNA is Sherrington. They're a big family. But so I'm associated. So if you look at the Sherringtons, who are a big family, it's like 50 or 60 of us when we go on holiday. You know, we all go in like a lot of people. You're like, I have as much right into the Sherrington family as the rest of the boys who are called Sherrington. But my name's a Cummins. So the Cummins family are married into, connected to the Sherrington family. But then you could say, well, if all the Cumminses got together and I could get all the 100,000 Cumminses together as a clan, then the Sherringtons at 50 would come into the... You know what I mean? It's it's about who has the power. And the Lannisters have the power. And all of their bannermen... Can anyone name the bannermen of the Lannisters? I can. Uh, but basically, the Lannisters are only a handful of people with a mass amount of money and power. And that's, they've just arrived there. And all their bannermen are their clansmen. The, the word again, clansmen. I love it. Yep. Yeah? So all the clansmen are in. Okay. So then what you find... So what we've got is the clan is everybody really. But actually, the clan is just that clan. And... The domain, the overall family, the, the house is all the lots of clans. So if we were to be really honest and true with this, it would be a case of the, ha the clan would hire other clans to create a house. There may or may not be intermarriage adoptions between them. 
and there is a pyramid scheme where the guys are at the top have the main name. The less second ranks are those of different names, but of the blood, and the ones below them are just hired. And that brings you into generational retainers and single generation retainers. Ronin, every, the other misconception, Ronin's, you know, not really good samurai or a bit outside the samurai. No, Ronin, anybody could be Ronin. You're only thinking of one period where Ronins were outlawed or to be a Ronin was a bad thing. Most of samurai history, you could swap and be a Ronin. Go away, you could make a load of money at war. Imagine you go to war and you make 50 grand and you come home, you've got 50 grand with the loot. I'm going to run around for a bit. Ronin. Okay, um, I'm down to 20 grand, down to 5 grand, down to 2. Right, okay, I'm going to be hired as a clansman. Clansman, I'm in somebody else's house i am not in their clan they are the main branch i accept there's cadet branches they might be somewhere else i might be here but i'm a i'm a clansman now but then i make another hundred grand and i go away for a couple of years i'm like yeah i'm gonna go blow it on cocaine and whores you know what i mean that's it right guys i hope you were pleasantly offended by half of my jokes i hope that it annoyed most of the woke culture out there and uh, I just hope you have learnt something. Sorry for a 30-minute video, but those guys, Scott from the Shogunate, Nick, oh, for God's sake, Nick from the Shogunate, Scott from Sengoku Studies, and Stephen Nogiri from Tada Genji, all linked in the pinned comment at the top, have done awesome jobs this month, and have given me a ton of work to do, and I've got it in just on time. Right, guys, if you've stuck to the end, give me a joke so I can keep the jokes coming. Get yourself a copy of this or one of my other books. I'm also the author of um, The uh, Ultimate Unofficial Guide to Tolkien's World. So if you're here at the end, go and have a look at it, guys, and see what you think, whether you want to get a copy.